Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. On August 14th, 1966, Lunar Orbiter 1 became the first U.S. spacecraft to enter the moon's orbit. The photographs taken by this spacecraft set the stage for where the Apollo missions would land on the moon. This was a monumental day in U.S. space history, as it was also a significant date in the story that we started last week with Neil Rosendahl, and it all revolves around the man named Duke Slater. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. This time as we step off the DeLorean, the date is August 14th. 1966, and we're sitting on the moon, and maybe we're bouncing around a little bit because a little bit less gravity. We're waving up there to Lunar Orbiter 1, because it's flying by us. Like I said, first time U.S. spacecraft will enter the moon's orbit. In a way, this marked the next steps on the journey for space travel. The day also happened to be important for this week's episode. Last week, we were mesmerized by a story about Duke Slater from Neil Rosendahl, the author of the book. Now, this day, August 14th, 1966, unfortunately, this is the date that Duke Slater passed away. But just like that long journey that Lunar Orbiter 1 took, it would help pioneer many things throughout space travel, as did Duke Slater pioneer many things throughout his life. But we stopped with the question, in the last interview, that is, the last episode, The question was, why have some referred to Duke Slater as the Jackie Robinson of the NFL? But again, (laughs) I do remind you, this is part two of a two-part series. So if you didn't hear that first one, you don't know what I'm talking about with this question, then you better mash that pause button, go back, listen to part one first. And you'll find out in there how we had a contest going on. And if you listen to it in the future, sorry, but the contest is over. I do want to announce the winner of the contest. And with that, I gotta give you a drum roll. My best impression of a drum roll. The winner of the book, the autographed Duke Slater biography by Neil Rosendahl, is Brandon from the Florida Focus Podcast. And I'm gonna give a special shout out not to just Brandon, but also Chris, because there's a little bit of tag team action going on at the Florida Focus Podcast, which is FloridaFocusPodcast.com. I'm gonna give you a quick little overview of what their bio says from their site. And it goes as such. A college football podcast. We have lifetime FSU Seminole fan, Brandon, and lifetime Florida Gator fan, Chris, putting aside their differences to bring you to the fantastic world of college football throughout the Sunshine State. Again, that's over at FloridaFocusPodcast.com. And I want to thank, I want to give a big special thanks out to Neil Rosendell, not just for this great interview that he had, but for donating the book and also giving his own little John Hancock on there and sending it over to Brandon. But if you didn't win, dunk it down, y'all. You have a chance to purchase your own book over on the website, which of course I'm going to leave links for the book, more on Neil Rosendell and Florida Focus Podcast over at the show notes, which you can get through the show notes through your podcast player choice or by heading directly to thefootballhistorydude.com, which now takes you over to my page over on the Sports History Network, which happens to be the headquarters for your favorite sports yesteryear. If you haven't heard this on the episode yet, on this podcast, 
this is a network at the very early stages. So if you know of a podcast or another show, YouTube channel, blog, whatever have you, or if you even want to start your own show or be a contributor through blog posts or anything like that regarding sports history, go ahead and hit us up over on the website. But for now, let's get back into the interview about Duke Slater. Yeah, I had seen something somewhere where they were comparing him to the Jackie Robinson of the NFL, but no one knew it or something like that. Yeah, I, I, and um, I, I, I appreciate the uh, the comparisons. I, I bristle a little bit at that because there's no real perfect uh, correlation in football to who Jackie Robinson was in baseball. Jackie Robinson basically broke a, a 50 year, you know, color ban on, on black players at the pro level. The, the color ban was so entrenched in baseball that they literally put together Negro leagues just for black players, because it was just established that black players wouldn't play there. And uh, the NFL wound up having a color ban too, but theirs only lasted 12 years and wasn't really quite as entrenched. The reason that I, that I, that I uh, take that a little bit personally is because um uh, there are a lot of people who like to promote Kenny Washington. Kenny Washington, uh, just to track the history of black players in the NFL, there were a number of black players in the NFL uh, up until 1933. Then there was a 12-year color ban uh, on black players. No black players in the NFL from 34 to 1945 for a dozen years. Then in 1946, four black players began playing pro football, uh, Kenny Washington and Woody Strode in the NFL, and then uh, uh, Bill Willis and Mary Motley in a competing league, the AAFC. Uh, but those four sort of reintegrated pro football. Um, but a lot of people have called Kenny Washington the first black player in modern pro football history. And in fact, uh, I think it was Sports Illustrated uh, several years back, wrote a, uh, an article uh, about Kenny Washington calling him football's Jackie Robinson. And to me, while I appreciate Kenny Washington's contributions to the NFL and everything he did to reintegrate the sport, I think it's important to say that he was reintegrating the sport, that there were black players who preceded him. And I don't want, you know, honoring Kenny Washington to turn into marginalizing the contributions of what Duke Slater and those other black players did in those days, because the reality is, uh, pro football in 1933 was not that much different from pro football in 1946, uh, you know, from when uh, those African-American players were playing in those first few years to when Kenny Washington made his debut. Certainly the differences in the NFL between 33 and 46 are not as pronounced as the differences uh, in pro football between 46 and today. So, um, you know, uh, Duke Slater was an important trailblazer. And unfortunately, over the years, he's kind of been overlooked and, and, and forgotten and I think it's important to honor all these guys and to not take anything away from any of them. And uh, uh, what, what Duke Slater did, uh, certainly in his time, in his period, he was the greatest black football player of his, of his era, of his generation. And, and frankly, one of the best linemen in professional football in the 1920s. Yeah, and speaking of 1920s and the 30s and 40s, he got into a college or to a coaching career, right? He did. Well, after he... he uh, after he played for the Cardinals, uh, he played for the Cardinals from 1926 to 1931. He retired after a 10-year career uh, in the NFL. And there was no you know, pressure for him to retire at all. Um, he could have played for the Chicago Cardinals as long as he wanted. But he said, you know, I hung it up when I realized football was a young man's game. 10 years was a very long career in those days. Um, in fact, when he retired, he had something like the third or fourth longest career uh, than any NFL player at that time. Now, remember, the NFL was still in its infancy, but still, 10-year career was seen as an extremely long career. But there was no pressure for him to get out at all. But once he did retire, two years after he retired, the NFL sort of passed an informal color ban. And there were no black players in the NFL from 1934 to 1945. And what Slater did during during this time was – you know, Slater had uh, had other interests. He he was more interested in law than he was in coaching. Certainly, he never had any ambitions to coach. He said, "I don't. I would hate to have my career tied up in uh, tied up in in the activities of eighteen to twenty one year old young men." <laughs> you know, he didn't. He 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 never was really that drawn to coaching. But when the color ban came down, 
he really started to coach almost as a matter of necessity. And what he did was he brought his own fame because he was one of the most famous black athletes in the country at the time. He brought his own name recognition, his own fame and everything else to organizing and assembling uh, all-star, all-black teams. So uh, teams of all black players and uh, all-star teams and you assemble them and you put them together and then you play games against white semi-pro teams, usually semi-pro uh, teams of white players to show that, you know, during the color ban, they said, oh, you can't have black players playing against white players because there'll be racial incidents and everything else. And what Slater was illustrating with these all-star, these all-black teams was, you know, we, these all-black team, an all-black all-star football team can play against an all-white all-star fo- football team, semi-pro team, and have no nasty incidents at all. So that, you know, sort of undermining that, that whole case and also giving an opportunity for these great black football players who were banned from the NFL, give them a place to play and give them, you know, something to do. And in fact, Kenny Washington actually played a few games for, for one of Duke Slater's teams. And, and Duke Slater had a number of great, great uh, uh, black football players uh, from that time playing on some of his teams. But he coached uh, several semi-pro teams there in the 30s and early 1940s while that ban was in place. And really, again, just to, just to show uh, the ludicrousness of, of the color ban itself. And then when the band came down, he, he put coaching uh, behind him. He, he wasn't interested in that as, a, as an actual career. But it's worth noting that that's something that, that he really did to tr- sort of try to actively uh, fight that prejudice at the time. So like you said, more of maybe out of necessity versus like he didn't necessarily want to go into that. He was more interested in his law career, which then that takes us to the next chapter of his life. How did that transition go? Well, he was always interested in law. He... Um, uh, got his bachelor's degree from the University of Iowa, and then uh, actually when he was still playing in Rock Island, uh, he first started attending law classes at the University of Iowa. And uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a fascinating story where he would, early in the week, on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, he'd go to Iowa City and attend law classes. And then later in the week, Thursday, Friday, he'd go back to Rock Island and practice, and then on Sunday, he'd play, in a, he'd play in an NFL game. And then he'd come back and he'd do it all over again. And so uh, it's kind of amazing that he was able to juggle those two things. And maybe says a lot about the NFL at that time as well, but it really also says a lot about his work ethic and the kind of man he was. Um, but uh, he earned his law degree from the University of Iowa College of Law in 1928, which is an impressive feat for uh, uh, a black man at that time to earn a law degree from a Big Ten institution in 1928. Um, but uh, his final couple of years uh, in Chicago, uh, with the Chicago Cardinals, he actually uh, practiced law and was a practicing attorney uh, while he was playing his final couple of years in the NFL. When his NFL career ended, he went into becoming a full-time attorney. Uh, he actually worked for the city uh, for a while as an attorney in the city of Chicago. And um, in 1928, uh, he was elected as just the second black judge in the history of the city of Chicago. Uh, he was elected to the uh, Cook County Municipal Court in uh, 1948. Um, he was the second black judge in, in uh, Chicago history after Wendell Green, who uh, uh, was elected as a judge six years earlier. But uh, when Duke Slater was elected as judge in, in 1948, uh, he earned almost one million votes, just shy of one million votes from across the city of Chicago. And uh, it's really indicative of how popular he was amongst black and white audiences. Black audiences, of course, loved him because he was, you know, he was one of them and he lived in the South side of Chicago. You know, he wasn't uh, one of these guys who sort of abandoned uh, where he had lived after he became famous and successful. Uh, He lived on the South side, uh, which is, you know, I was his home. That was where he was raised. Um, There's actually a really interesting story uh, about that, that, um, you know, he, he, he had remembered growing up as a little boy he played in one of the vacant lots. He learned football in the vacant lots on the south side of Chicago. So he played in this vacant lot. And uh, a couple decades later, um, when he was playing for the Chicago Cardinals, the Chicago Cardinals built their home field, which was called Normal Field. They built that over that vacant lot. So he was playing on the same spot where he had you know, learned the game on the streets. Well, then fast forward a couple decades later, he's elected a judge. The Cardinals leave Chicago. They tear down Normal Field. Would you believe it? They build a courthouse on what used to be Normal Field, and Duke Slater is assigned as a judge there. He's presiding as a judge in this courtroom 
which is over normal field where he had played as a pro player, which is where he'd learned the game when it was a vacant lot before that. So in, in one specific location, he had gone from learning the game of football as a schoolyard boy uh, to uh, playing pro football with the Chicago Cardinals to being a, a judge on the South side of Chicago. And so, you know, he was uh, the guys on the South side of Chicago loved him. And then white audiences, of course, revered him too for his time in college, uh, especially, but also in the pros, you know, they, they, they admired him and loved him as a, as a football star uh, as well. And so, you know, Everybody who met Duke Slater uh, had n- nothing but wonderful things to say. Well, with a random couple of exceptions, as, as you might expect, but uh, he was beloved. He was a beloved guy and, um, and just had a fascinating career arc. Yeah, speaking of that fascinating career arc, I mean, it's like like you said, in that one particular spot, it's crazy. You could put like a stake and have, I don't know, a movie made around it and like it transforms from one gener- or from one era to the next and then the final I guess the climax for as far as his career goes this past year, well, not quite yet, but being honored as far as the NFL goes. And I'm going to let you talk about that because you obviously have some passion for this individual with your book, but I think it goes beyond that. I think you feel like you've had a connection almost with the story. So tell me how you felt when you found out what is about to happen in basically three months. Well, it's... I've had so many uh, fun moments uh, over the course of this this last decade, sort of uh, promoting a Duke Slater's career and really, um, you know, advocating that that he be recognized in the way he deserves to be recognized. And certainly, one of those moments came came about in January uh, when I wrote the book. There were a number of different things that I would like to have seen achieved to uh, to really enhance Duke Slater's legacy. And one of those, and probably the biggest one, uh, was uh, for his election to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. He had an interesting arc with respect to the Pro Football Hall of Fame because uh, when it started, uh, he was considered one of the top candidates. Uh, he was listed as one of the top. Uh, you know, there, an article would come out saying, "Here are seven strong candidates for the Pro Football Hall of Fame," and six of them would go in immediately. And Duke Slater was the one who was seemingly always left waiting. And uh, he was actually a finalist the first couple of years for the Pro Football Hall of Fame uh, when. The first two years of the Pro Football Hall of Fame announced the finalist lists. Uh, in 1970 and 1971, he was on the finalist lists, and it looked like he's going to get in uh, really quickly. Well, in 1972, uh, they introduced the seniors pool. So now Duke Slater's only way to get into the Pro Football Hall of Fame is if he's elected by the seniors committee. Well, the seniors committee can only pick one person, later two people, every year. And they just, you know, they have a large number of people who are all qualified, and he just kept getting overlooked. And then time passes, people forget about him, the people who played with him died, the people who saw him play died. And uh, he just was, his his story was really forgotten, even though he he clearly had a Hall of Fame caliber career. So, uh, you know, part of writing the book in 2012 was resurrecting that Hall of Fame campaign and and trying to get him in, and uh, how complex that is. Because, of course... You know, I, I had to speak with a number of voters and 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 do kind of a, a lot of legwork, uh, trying to get people to hear the story. And it's difficult because the the voters for the Pro Football Hall of Fame have an impossible task. They just do. Uh, they're only able to pick maybe one or two people a year, and yet there's dozens of qualified guys. So it wasn't even making the argument that hey, Duke Slater is worthy of being in the Hall of Fame. These Hall of Fame voters recognize that immediately. It was all right. He deserves to be in the Hall of Fame, and he needs to go in now. Like, you know, you can't keep passing him over for other qualified guys. Like it needs to be his turn. And that's a, that's sort of a harder argument to make, but uh, there were a couple of guys who really supported it. And and certainly uh, Rick Goslin, uh, who's a sports writer down in, in Texas is, is someone who uh, was a, was a key supporter of, of Duke Slater's candidacy. But um, uh, this past year in, in, in 2020, they announced that they were going to have a centennial class where basically they were going to, uh, instead of having one or two seniors every year, they were going to elect a slate of 10 seniors. And uh, once they announced that, I, you know, you could kind of uh, re- see the, read the tea leaves. You kind of see the writing on the wall and say, look, you know, if, if you really feel like he's got a legitimate serious shot to get in, this is the year you got to push him and, and really, really advocate to get him in. And, you know, especially because the whole point of the centennial class was celebrating the 100th anniversary of the NFL, celebrating its roots, celebrating how far we've come. 
uh, people who've meant so much to the history of the game. I was like, this, all this just fits Duke's later to a T. But uh, so I felt good going into it and, and with the groundwork of the campaign we, we put together, but you still don't know. I mean, you just, you have no idea, you, you, you know? And so uh, they made the announcement, of course, on, on NFL Network uh, in January and you're, you're sort of waiting and holding your breath. And when they put his, his, his name and his, uh, you know, his picture up on, on the screen, I mean, I, I, I was literally jumping up and down, you know, fighting back tears in my living room. And, you know, it's funny because you get that reaction and then probably most of the reaction, most football fans is like, wait, who, who is this? Like, like they don't know. But the, the great thing about the Duke Slater story is football fans are saying, wait, who is he? Uh, like, how long ago did he play? You know, and there's that initial skepticism. Then they read about it. They hear about him. Like they want to read about who it is to maybe criticize it more or whatever else. And then once they read it, they're like, oh. Okay. Well, all right. <laughs> like, like the the tone immediately changes to saying, "Oh, okay. Well, yeah, this guy deserves to get in." I mean, can't argue that, you know. And so it's fun to see how people hear it and initially are are asking, "Wait, Duke Slater, who?" And then the second they learn a little bit about the story, it completely they completely turn around and they realize just how deserving this guy is and just what an amazing story he had. And I think that's what's so great about his election to the Pro Football Hall of Fame because, you know, he's he's. He's been, he's passed away. He passed away in 1966. So he's been gone. He's been dead for over 50 years. You say, well, who cares? Well, the reason it matters is because, you know, some little kid's going to walk into Canton and they're going to see a bust of Duke Slater and they're going to be like, wait, who's that one? Who's that guy? And they're going to go home. They're going to look up his story and they're going to learn who Duke Slater was. And that's why it's important. And that's why it matters. If you want to represent the history of the game, you know, as, as, as John Madden said, you know, if, if all the busts are talking, uh, after the lights go down, they're all talking to each other. Then Duke Slater's a voice that needs to be in that conversation. He needs to be in that room, and now he will be forever. You know, he'll have his voice in that room, and he's so deserving of that. And it just it it's, it thrills me that that that's going to happen, and that uh, you know I played whatever small role I did in, in in helping make sure that that happened. Yeah, and speaking of looking at the research, and again, I can tell the passion coming through the speaker here, and I can see it, and it's almost like I wish this was a video <laughs> um, podcast here. Going back, and this may be an impossible task, but like, what was the most interesting or intriguing or like, oh my goodness, kind of moment when you were researching his whole career that, that kind of jumped out at you? Uh, yeah, it, it really is hard to pinpoint that because there were so many of those, those moments that just sort of, that sort of took you back. But, um, to me, just the, how impressed people were by, by the, the dignity he showed who he was and, uh, you know, how he was able to overcome all these obstacles. You know, he's, he's one of these guys where you don't have a lot of great stories with him in terms of him fighting, uh, injustice in terms of his race, because he really didn't, um, he, he didn't publicize it. He didn't make a big deal about it. Um, you know, you heard some of the stories secondhand about what a great football player he was, how, you know, uh, on one occasion he was playing, uh, against a player and both players were down on the ground and, you know, they were kicking him or sort of kicking at him and, uh, starting to get dirty. And Duke Slater, uh, according to, one of the, the guys on the opposing team was telling the story. He said, Duke Slater got up. He looked at the guy who was kicking him and he said, he just, he just in a real low controlled voice. He said, son, don't do that again. Cause I don't want to hurt you. And that was it. That was all he had to say. And it, it put it away. And you know, that was what it took to stop it because he was also one of the biggest and most intimidating guys on the field. And so it was, there was a little bit of a, all right, let's, let's don't mess with this guy. You know, another story I love telling, and this is from his college days, but I, I love it. He played in college for a guy by the name of Howard Jones, who is a legendary coach, both at Iowa, and then he went down to be the head coach at USC. And he he went to, I think, uh, won five Rose Bowl games as a head coach at USC. Howard Jones was just a phenomenal uh, coach. But when Duke Slater showed up there as a completely new recruit, Howard Jones was one of these hands-on coaches where he hadn't, uh, he, he had been a, an All-American at, at Yale, and he wasn't that far removed from his uh, playing career. So Howard Jones would show guys how, how to do things. And so one day he was teaching line play, and he wanted to find the biggest guy out there. 
to kind of demonstrate this this uh, this technique on. He was going to show how a smaller defensive lineman could push back uh, a bigger offensive lineman, how he, you know, with a charge and what have you. So he scans the crowd, he find, looks, and he sees Duke Slater, biggest guy in the crowd. I mean, he's a huge, gigantic black man. So he says, "You, I'm, you know, come up. I'm going to show you." So here's the demonstration. So he lines up against him. The whistle blows, and Howard Jones charges into him. You know, uh, uses his defensive line charge and charges into him. And Duke Slater takes a step back, neutralizes the charge, pushes forward. And the next thing anybody knows, Duke Slater is lying on the ground on top of Howard Jones. Howard Jones is lying on his back with Duke Slater on top of him. <laughs> and all the Iowa players who are standing watching this demonstration, you know, they're trying to control their laughter because they're like, well, that didn't work, <laughs> Coach Jones. And uh, Howard Jones said afterwards, he said, there are two things I took away from that experience. He said, number one, I never uh, illustrated a move on a player in practice until I had seen him actually performing in practices and games, and I knew what his talent level was. And number two, I never demonstrated any move again on Duke Slater. And uh, I just I love that story because it's, uh, it's an example of just how this soft-spoken – but incredibly talented, strong, resilient man was able to win people over and win people in, uh, into his corner. And uh, it worked with his college coach, and it really worked with with almost everyone he met. And he did that, like you said, pretty much everybody he met, every phase of his life, let's go college, NFL, and then beyond. I'm typically asked this in a different way, but I'm going to give you the virtual <laughs> keys to my DeLorean, right? You're going to go back in time. You get to choose one of those three main phases, college, NFL, or after. And you can sit down and have a dinner with Duke Slater. What phase would you go to and what would be some of the questions or what would be the one question you'd ask him? Um, well, that's a good question. I mean, I think uh, obviously growing up uh, uh, in in Iowa and being a Hawkeye fan, um, I would love to hear about his uh, his collegiate career uh, because I, I first became a fan of his through uh, his his college exploits. Um, but obviously, there's the temptation to go to the very end of his career when he can talk about uh, really everything that 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 he went through. Um, he's he's such an amazing man because, like I said, for a lot of these guys, um, you can point to uh, the discrimination that they faced or, you know, the, uh, the prejudice that they uh, encountered and, and really talk to him about it. Duke Slater never really talked about it. And I think that's one of the reasons maybe why he was, he was overlooked so much because he just, he was grateful for everything. And he was not a guy who would complain about things or, or talk about how, you know, maybe he should have been better remembered than he was or anything like that. He was always just a man who was grateful for everything. And, um, I, you know, he, he died, like I said, in 1966, really before uh, the civil rights movement was, was fully realized. And when I think black players were more comfortable about talking about some of the things that they encountered uh, in their lives and in their careers. And so, you know, I, I would have loved to have, to have heard about that. But Duke Slater was one of those guys where when you talk to him about uh, some of the great things that, that, that he did, he would always just sort of smile and say, oh, I was just doing my best or, or those kinds of things. And uh, he was so humble. And I think that's one of the reasons why he was able to play uh, when they were putting down a color ban uh, during his, his career or trying to. Uh, you know, he was one of the, the few black players who was able to cross those, those lines. And part of it was because he was always giving credit to everybody else. Uh, he was always kind of deflecting the praise. And, uh, you know, he played – with and against some of the great players in, in, in pro football history, you know, Ernie Nevers and Jim Thorpe and, uh, you know, Red Grange and, and Hallis and Lambeau, all the legendary names. He played with all of them. And, you know, you'd love to hear about that, but you'd also love to hear about, you know, Duke Slater, the man and how he was able to, you know, to, to overcome all of those things with such, you know, such a positive attitude because, you know, he, he never looked back. Uh, with regret, uh, the things that he wasn't able to achieve in his in his football career, he was always thankful of football for everything. I think he credited football for being able to graduate with a law degree and start his his career as an attorney and a judge. And I think he maybe felt like he would not have had those opportunities had he not been a famous football player, or or at least it would have made those a lot harder. 
And so he was just thankful for everything. And, and he focused on the positives more so than the negatives. And it's just such a wonderful, wonderful worldview. I would love to be able to, uh, to tell him that. And of course, what I really love is, to, you know, is to let him know, you know, that his legacy really over the last 10 years has been honored in such a magnificent way. And not just at the University of Iowa, but also obviously with the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Uh, I, 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 I'd, I think that wherever Duke Slater is now, hopefully he knows that he hasn't been forgotten and that we're doing right by him, by honoring him. Because he's a story that, honestly, every young school kid, black, white, I don't care, every young school kid should know the Duke Slater story. They should know who he is. And, you know, he was, he was absolutely a hero. He was absolutely an example of living your life the right way. And uh, of overcoming challenges and obstacles that never should have been put in front of him, but doing it with a smile and doing it anyway. He's the kind of guy who every you know young kid should know who he is and know his story, and 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 celebrate him. And so you know the fact that he's getting this kind of exposure where more people are learning about him, I just think that's 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 wonderful. And 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 for us, that's that's us doing right by him. Yeah, I was going to ask you to kind of summarize Duke Slater, but I think you've already <laughs> done that as far as, you know, obviously the book's going to cover a lot more of the details than the minutia. So we'll put links to that and everything on the show notes, as well as your website. Is there any other place that fans of the show should go if they want to learn about either Duke Slater or yourself? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I've written a few articles about him. Uh, they're up at uh, uh, dukeslater.com. If you just uh, type in dukeslater.com and follow that link, you'll get to my website and be able to learn more about Duke Slater. I've written a, a bio of him and some of the other initiatives I think that we still have to try to honor his legacy. Obviously, Duke Slater getting into the Pro Football Hall of Fame is a wonderful, wonderful thing. It's a, a tremendous thing for him. But, you know, there are a number of other things that I think we can do to really help enhance his legacy. I would love, you know, since this, is, uh, this talks about pro football, you know, I, I've touched on the fact that he was the first African-American to play for a current NFL franchise. And now with him going into the Pro Football Hall of Fame and everything else, I think he absolutely should be uh, honored and recognized by the Arizona Cardinals organization. And I know it's a difficult position to put them in because, you know, the Arizona Cardinals, uh, they, you know, they are descended from the Chicago Cardinals uh, lineage, but yet they kind of want to celebrate their own tradition and people who are from Arizona and everything else. But the simple fact of the matter is, is he wore Cardinals colors. He played for the Cardinal organization. And, um, you know, I would, you know, I would love the, the Arizona Cardinals to put him up in their ring of honor. I think, you know, where they have the great names of, of, you know, they have guys like Jim Conselman and, and uh, Ernie Nevers and guys he played alongside. Uh, they have them up in the ring of honor and, uh, those are guys who maybe weren't ever in Arizona, but I would love to see the Arizona Cardinals recognize Duke Slater in a similar way because, again, I think it's you – know, for me, it's about getting his story out there to where the more places we can put his story out where people can stumble upon it and, and pique their interest and have people say, you know, oh, let's look at the Ring of Honor. Oh, there's a name I may not know. Let's look him up. Let's see what we know about him. And then they find out, oh, that's the name of the first black lineman in NFL history. Uh, you know, what a tremendous, wonderful thing that is. And so, you know, the more that we can do uh, for that for him, uh, the better. And uh, the job's not yet done, but obviously getting Duke Slater to, to Canton was a major, major step. Um, and uh, but, but there are a few more things like, uh, like that with the Arizona Cardinals I'd like to see done. And uh, uh, we'll just keep working on it. And again, hopefully spread this story uh, to a wider audience because it's a story well worth telling and, and, and a man who is just uh, – deserving of every, every accolade that can be bestowed upon him. Yeah, I could definitely see a, uh, a movie out of it too, considering there's so many depths of stories, not just a player's career, but then afterwards and everything. Like you said, he's the man that he was, not just the player that he was. Yeah. I mean, I've, I, I can't tell you how many people I've, I've had tell me that have, have read the book or read his story and said, this sounds like a movie. This sounds like a Disney movie, honestly. And uh, unfortunately, I don't know anything about movies or movie people. I don't know any of them. Hopefully movie type people listen to podcasts like this or, or what have you. But the, you know, the main thing is, is, you know, get this story in the hands of people who can read it and be inspired by it because it is an inspiring story and an inspiring uh, life well lived. 
Well, if we can ever get that movie, I tell you what, I want to be one of the stunt doubles or something like that in the movie. So I'll, here we go. We'll push for it. <laughs> All right, let's push for it. I, I think that'd be a great thing. <laughs> but other than that, though, Neil, I mean, is there anything else that you have as far as words of wisdom or anything like that for the fans of the show? Um, I, I mean, I don't know that I have that much wisdom on my own. I think, you know, I think it's, it's uh, again, uh, my motivation for writing this was that uh, we know the story of Jackie Robinson. We know the story of Muhammad Ali. We know the story of, you know, guys like uh, Bill Russell and things like that. But there are so, so many, even within the realm of sports, there are so many great stories of black heroes. And I mean, like legitimately where you talk about uh, courage in sports and it's overused. I mean, you know, even today, you know, there's, you know, there, I think with the money involved and everything else, and that's not to talk down uh, sports today, but I think, you know, you can overuse that word in courage, uh, you know, but I think, you know, with guys like Duke Slater, it's absolutely applicable. I mean, there's no other a better word for it. And so to be able to tell those stories and, you know, there are other stories out there like it. And, you know, I think part of with what our country's going through today and our society's going through today, I think, you know, I, I try to find the positive in everything. And one of the positives that I would say with this is this is a great opportunity for us to not only learn about the great stories of, you know, of true black trailblazers and pioneers, but also uncover new ones because they're out there, you know, they're out there and they're there to be found and let's find them and let's celebrate them because, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. I think, you know, there are a lot of great people out there worthy of, of, of praise and admiration. And, um, you know, this is one of those stories. And so I'm, I'm glad to represent this one and, and, Hopefully I have a few more in me uh, to find, but uh, as a storyteller, that's what drives me is finding these, these wonderful stories. And uh, I was, I was very lucky to, uh, to stumble upon this one with Duke Slater. So we don't have a little teaser bomb for the next uh, adventure yet. Uh, not for my next adventure. Well, uh, for my book, um, again, like I say, I'm, I'm, I'm a storyteller. I'm a writer. I've written four books previously. I'm currently working on my fifth book, which is being, you know, hung up with the coronavirus and everything else that's, that's been going on. But uh, I'm currently working on a book uh, on, a, on a man uh, by the name of Bump Elliott, uh, who was a phenomenal guy. He was uh, a Big Ten MVP at Michigan, um, a football player, and, and played multiple sports. And then he became uh, head football coach at Michigan for 10 years. Uh, most people remember him as the guy who preceded Bo Schembechler. And then uh, he became a longtime athletic director at the University of Iowa which kind of helped me discover his story. But uh, that book hopefully is going to come out uh, within the year. Um, again, with all the coronavirus, it's gotten delayed and everything. But uh, I'm really excited for that book as well because, you know, it's like Duke Slater where, you know, what I love to see is Bump Elliott was a guy who he had a lot of professional success. But the other, the other thing that people remember about him was nobody had a bad thing to say about him. I mean, he was a wonderful guy, a wonderful, decent human being. and you know, that's where the connection is with Duke Slater, where if you can write about people who have professional success, that's great. I don't think there's much of a book if guys didn't have a certain threshold of professional success. But if you can also focus on the fact that they're decent people, they're good husbands, like they're good, you know, they're men of faith. They're people who are decent, admirable human beings. That to me just makes it doubly worth uh, uh, having these stories be told. And so when you can find those two things come together, it's really magic. And, uh, you know, those are kind of stories that I'm searching for and have, have tried to, to publicize. And uh, uh, it's great to me. It's, it's just a wonderful honor to be able to tell some of those stories. Now, I know I said this in the interview a few times, but I wish that this was a video recording because I'm sure you can hear it through his voice. This dude talks with some enthusiasm and passion for a person and a topic. You can tell. If you were able to watch that video, you could see it through his eyes. You could look through it. You could peer into his eyes and you could tell how much this guy cares about the story of Duke Slater and, and everything else that was revolved around the history of Duke Slater. It really makes me wish that I could hop in my DeLorean, you know, make sure it was a real thing, not just a virtual DeLorean we're talking about. Because I'd like to go back in time, relive some of these just truly amazingly challenging situations that people had to go through so you can get a better appreciation 
for what we have today. Maybe I bring this up, I don't know, because recently we had the 35th anniversary of the Back to the Future, the first one that is back in 1985. And, you know, yours truly, recently been digging in, watching them all over again. I'm going to watch them some more. Speaking of that, well, hey, you want to pretend like you're taking my DeLorean? You can share your favorite moment on the show as well. You can do so over at sportshistorynetwork.com. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.